women make up more than half of our population and there is a necessity to raise awareness about the need for women and young girls of the world to have equitable opportunities in employment and education. In whereas in Beaumont, we recognize the contributions of women to our community as entrepreneurs, decision makers, employees and citizens. And whereas we call attention to their ability and willingness to contribute to Canada's economic, political and social communities. And whereas for many among us, our future depends on the success of women in our community. And whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value of the, of the accomplishments of women in our community, therefore be it resolved that I, Mayor John Stewart, do hereby proclaim March 8th, 2020 as International Women's Day in the City of Beaumont, Alberta, dated this 25th day of February 2020. Our next, uh, our next proclamation is Bullying Awareness Day. Uh, this is being done in can also known as Pink Shirt Day and being done in conjunction with a number of other initiatives in our community. And before I read the proclamation, I would like to say thank you to those members of council tonight that are in attendance and wearing pink shirts in support of this initiative. Uh, it's really appreciated to help bring awareness to this very important uh, issue in our community. So whereas Bullying Awareness Day highlights Beaumont's commitment to a safe and inclusive community, and whereas acts of bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, intimidation, and violence have a profound effect on an individual's feelings of safety, self-worth, and ability to learn and are unacceptable in a safe, caring, and orderly society. And whereas communities, workplaces, families, schools, and individuals all have a critical role to play in modeling, teaching, and promoting socially responsible behavior. And whereas Bullying Awareness Day is an opportunity to actively promote respectful and kind behavior and to celebrate the actions of individuals, schools, and groups to address bullying, now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Mayor John Stewart, to do hereby proclaim February 26, 2020, as Bullying Awareness Day in the city of Beaumont, Alberta, dated this 14th day of February 2020. Thank you very much for indulging me in that. Uh, are there, administration, are there any changes to the agenda as presented? Thank you, Your Worship. Administration doesn't have any changes to the agenda at this time. Thank you very much. Can I get a member of council move to adopt the agenda as presented? Councilor Hendricks. So moved, Your Worship. Discussion on the motion? Uh, seeing none, all in favor? That carries unanimously. All oh, right. Councilor Van Newkirk? Yay. Okay. Thank you. It's going to be one of those nights. <laughs> Uh, tonight we have three items on our consent agenda. I move that council consent to approve the following agenda items without debate. Uh, item 5A, regular council meeting February 11, 2020. Item 5B, committee of the whole minutes from February 18, 2020. And item 10A, councillor Stout's report. All in favor? Sure. sure. In favor. Well, I don't think we need to exempt the report, but you can follow up at a counselor inquiries and ask him a question. Save us the vote later. <laughs> no worries. Uh, all in favor? In favor. Uh, carries unanimously. We have no items on the open forum this evening, which brings us to item 6A. Which brings us to item 6A, a public hearing for bylaw 9720. So at this time I will declare that the public hearing is open and that the hearing is being held pursuant to sections 230, 606 and 692 of the Municipal Government Act. Uh, as amended, Ms. Winter. Oh, great. Councillor Hendricks. Your Worship, thank you. And uh, under Section 172 of the Municipal Government Act, I wish to declare a pecuniary interest on this matter. My pecuniary interest is embedded within the relationship my company, Hendricks Construction Limited, has with a development company actively working in the Bull Valley site area. So I'll step out at this time. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Ms. Mayor. Thank you, Worship. Through you to members of council and the public. The purpose of bylaw 970-20 is to amend bylaw 878-17 Beauval Park, Beaumont Lakes Area Structure Plan. 
The notice of the public hearing was provided in writing to the assessed landowner, the adjacent landowners, the applicant, school boards, and other agencies. The public hearing notice was advertised in the local newspaper on February 14th and 21st, 2020. The public hearing notice was advertised on Beaumont's website beginning February 11th, 2020. Any written submissions received and not included in the public hearing agenda package are read into the record at this time. I do have one submission that was received after the deadline. The letter is from Ms. Faye St. Louis. Dear Sir, Madam, regarding the area structure plan amendment application, the aforementioned application to change the land use designation from residential supportive and assisted living to medium density residential has me concerned. This change is not in the best interest of current and future citizens of Beauval slash Beaumont Lakes area. There is a value in keeping the original designation of residential supportive and assisted living for the 1.39 hectare parcel of land. Residential supportive and assisted living accommodations are needed in the southeast. People deserve to stay in their own community as they continue to maintain current connections with family, friends, and make new connections. Leaving the land designation as originally planned would allow citizens to benefit from closer access to southwest businesses. They would also benefit from those businesses that are sure to open in the southeast corner in the near future. Not only would these businesses be walking in dis walking distance or a short drive away, but future Beaumont Transit initiatives may only, may only start along 50th Street due to cost constraint. This would be this would enable the residents to ride north in order to bank attend uh, to attend doctor appointments, etc. I encourage the City of Beaumont to keep the land use designation as residential supportive and assisted living in the Beauval Park slash Beaumont Lakes area, South area. The, Beaum the City of Beaumont's rapidly growing population is a testament to the motto, life is better in Beaumont. Let's continue to respect that. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, sincerely, Ms. Faye St. Louis. Thank you. Thank you very much. This time, I'd like to ask the Director for Planning and Development or the designate to come on down. Greetings, thank you, Council, um, Your Worship, Council members of the public. With me tonight is Emily Sangster, Long Range Planner with our Planning and Development Department. She will be taking you through this application. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship, members of Council. We are here tonight for the public hearing for Bylaw 97020 to amend the Beauval Park, Beaumont Lake South Area Structure Plan in Southeast Beaumont. This was or originally approved in June 2017. An area structure plan is a statutory plan that provides high-level planning, transportation, and servicing framework for a specific area and must be consistent with all higher-level plans. Recognizing that we have other presenters at this public hearing, I will briefly summarize the application and administration's position uh, and will provide additional info as needed at uh, second reading. So if we can pull up the amendment map on page 81 of the council package. Thank you. Uh, the first key component of this application is to change the land use designation of a 1.39 hectare parcel from residential supportive and assisted living uh, to medium density residential. This is the green parcel on this amendment map. To maintain the overall plan density of the planned area, the plan area, uh, the application proposes to update the plan density of the medium density residential, residential designation from 40 to 48 units per hectare, which also affects the purple parcels shown on this map and also to update the plan density of the mixed use designation from 40 to 45 units per hectare, which affects the yellow parcel shown on this map. As all of the affected parcels are undeveloped, this amendment only affects land use and density requirements for future development. As we noted at first reading, administration's view is that this application is in alignment with MDP and regional growth plan policies that promote the development of complete communities, offering a variety of services and housing options for all stages of life. We note that in 2016, 90% of the housing supply in Beaumont had three or more bedrooms. At the same time, 41% of households had two or fewer people, and the share of Beaumont residents aged 65 and over was increasing. So this proposed change to the land use designation would continue to permit the type of development envisioned by the existing residential supportive and assisted living designation. 
At the same time, it would also offer the flexibility for other types of housing that will help meet growing needs in Beaumont and contribute to developing a complete community. We anticipate that this amendment will increase the variety of housing options that are suitable for smaller households and older residents. And we note that the construction of this housing and a potential resulting increase in residents in Southeast Beaumont may in turn support development on nearby commercial parcels. Overall, administration's view is that this application is consistent with the city's land use planning objectives and requirements and is therefore recommending approval. And we'd be happy to take any questions before the next presenter. Thank you very much. Really appreciate all the work, hard work that's gone in by both the applicant and yourselves into getting this to this point. I will open it up to members of council for clarifying questions. I see none. Hang on, I'm just checking with Councillor Randy Kirk. Yeah, no questions. Thank you. No questions? Cool. All right, so at this point, I would like to invite the applicant or their designate to come on down and, and make a presentation. Please state your name and who you are for the record. And so thank you, Your Worship, and members of council for having us this evening. My name is Kaylin Stark. I'm a senior planner with Invista Consulting. And beside me is Dan Rojek, the vice president of Landrix Ventures. Perfect, it kind of works. Um, the Beauval uh, Beaumont Lakes ASP is located in Southeast Beaumont. The 50th Street and Highway 625 bound the west and south boundary of the plan area. And the parcel that we're speaking to today is in the center of the plan area with 32nd Avenue bounding the site to the north and 30th Avenue bounding the site to the south. The MDP um, designates the parcel for residential development. So just a quick history over the parcel. Um, the ASP was prepared and approved in 2017. At that time, there was a proposed 145 dwelling unit supportive and assisted living facility that was intended for the site. This development never came to flourishing and the site remains undeveloped. The, uh, recently, the parcel has changed ownership with Lendrix Ventures purchasing the property. As a result of land ownership changes, previous development concepts will no longer move forward. So the current ASP very specifically prescribes the previous development concept. As a result, any changes to this concept does require an ASP amendment. The proposed amendment changes the land use from one, for the 1.39 hectare site from residential supportive and assisted living to the medium density residential land use. Medium density residential enables a diversity of housing products and does not limit the type of development, such as seniors living. Dan will further speak to Landrix's vision in the, about the property a little later. So as a result of the amendments to the land use, there was amendments to the land use statistics um, just to maintain the overall plan density. The medium density site, including the previous assisted living parcel, it decreased from 270 units to 214 units. And the mixed use parcel increased from the plan 35 units to 38 units. These amendments to the statistics allowed the ASP to maintain the same overall density of 25 units per hectare. So also understanding that the parcel is situated adjacent to residential development, um, we engaged the community prior to submitting the application. Firstly, a pre-notification letter was mailed to landowners in late July 2019. We received three responses from this letter. As well, due to the impact of the overall density of the plan area, we consulted with the mixed-use landowner. The mixed-use landowner indicated support for the slight increase in density on their site. And also during the engagement of the existing ASP, the landowners to the west of the property were involved in the 145 unit um, proposal and they were concerned about the increase, the high density on that site. As a result, a mitigation policy was incorporated into the ASP, which required consideration for building placement and enhanced landscaping. The proposed ASP amendments include the same policy to ensure that impacts on existing residential are mitigated. During the design of the site, this policy has been considered for and implemented. And so the ASP amendment is being driven by land ownership changes. The ASP um, previous land ownership has changed and the specific development no longer is being developed. As a result, this ASP amendment is required. The amendment supports a diversity of housing types in the neighborhood and in Beaumont. 
the housing products can range from town housing to apartment housing, which provides a diversity of housing options to support all stages of life and lifestyles. The land is also currently districted in the integrated neighborhood district, which, which enables a diversity of multi-unit housing that does not preclude seniors living from being incorporated. Both the ASD amendment and land use districts support this property, developing into a community that has a diversity of housing typologies. So now I'm going to pass it on to Dan to speak about the proposed concept. Um, I'm really excited to be here to present this project. Landrex has a very good history here in Beaumont. Uh, that's our sister company. And uh, we at Landrex Ventures are very excited to develop here. One of the reasons is just the, the location of the site. Uh, there's a lot of amenities that will make it a very walkable site. Uh, there's the Beaumont uh, lakes and trail system to the north. Uh, the LeBlanc Canal and trees stand to the east of us. Um, there's a future commercial site being developed, I think, spring of 2021 to the south of us. Grocery store, daycare, cafe, etc. And also there's a school within walking distance to the, um, to the uh, west of us. So it's a great location. Um, we, my background is assisted living. I was with an executive at Christensen Developments for seven years. I did a lot of assisted living. We did um, a market study for assisted living in Beaumont. I also, uh, knowing how the grant system, the ASLE grant system works in the province, um, assisted living uh, development for this site was not feasible just because otherwise it'd have to be private pay. People have to pay out of the pockets so if there's no government grants uh, at this point. Um, we also had a lot of good information from our Altus report saying that at this time, uh, the need is just not there. There's enough uh, supply to uh, to meet the demand for assisted living. So we just we couldn't we couldn't uh, meet the density requirements for assisted living on this site, um, uh, unfortunately. But what the market study did indicate was that we can provide a diverse housing mix that meets different uh, demographic needs. So on the uh, west side and the left side, you'll see uh, 32 townhomes. Um, uh, there are uh, three bedroom, two and a half bath, two car garage, private uh, yard. Um, great for young families, great for people looking to potentially downsize. Um, uh, and then to the um, to the east, you'll see basically a four-story walk-up apartment with 85 units, mix of one bedroom, two bedroom, two bedroom, and then great um, exposure to the tree stand to the east. And now, very important to say is that all those units are accessible units in terms of door widths, in terms of turning radius in the bathroom, and in terms of um, the. Um, uh, what else was it? Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, the doors and shower lifts, sorry, and shower lifts. So the vision for this site really is that you can have a, a multi-generational um, uh, demographic. You could have a family uh, living in one unit and you could have uh, their the grandparents living in the next unit. There's also an underground parkade there and many amenities will have an outdoor communal area, a fitness center, an entertainment room, dog wash station and, and much more. So it's a really great site. Uh, and we're looking at construction starting in uh, May of 2020 for this for this project and continuing unless until August 2021. The next few slides speak to um, show a few renderings uh, just to give you a, a taste of what it's going to look like. Um, uh, it's East Pine is the name that we've come up with. Again, on the right side you've got the apartments. On the on the west side you have the uh, the townhomes. Um, very uh, elegant uh, design. And here's an outdoor area for people to congregate. Here's a little sample of the interior. Again, you can see the low lip on the shower turning radius. Again, this is market market units, but they accommodate uh, anybody with disabilities or with uh, who want to age in place. So it'd be great for people to age in place and getting home care come into the units uh, to service them. And here's the little fitness center. And here's uh, the entertainment room. So the... Um, Again, the vision for this site is one of uh, having inter intergenerational um, uh, living. So we have young families, seniors, single families. Again, you can have a, a young family living with the grandparents next door. It's a great mix of, of units. A lot of housing options. Again, you've got the townhomes and you have the apartments, the one bedroom, two bedroom, two bedroom and dance. So you have a great diversity of housing options. Accessibility, as I mentioned, door widths, um, the uh, back to turning radius, the shower lips. Um, you've got a lot of amenities there. People can stay active. Um, walkability, you can walk. There's great pedestrian access across the site. You have also uh, egress, ingress from 30th Avenue and 32nd Avenue. Uh, and also, uh, there's a great sense of community just by virtue of having uh, the amenities on site and the density and the um, 
and the, uh, the mix of different demographics. So with that, um, I, that concludes our presentation. Thank so, you. Thank you for hearing us. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much. I appreciate your coming in and sharing your vision for this piece of property with us. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about my radio going off in the middle of your presentation, but uh, at this time I'd like to open it up to members of council for questions. Councilor Barnhart. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, you've clarified for me what was the change around the uh, supportive living and assisted living, because that was where I was concerned that we had an opportunity and was being lost, but uh, understand the government grants are not available. Mm -hmm. But I, I do also understand that it's not we're not ruling it out as a possibility if those grants do become available, at least mm -hmm. I think. That we're not to the point yet where we've used all the land, right? So mm -hmm. we still have opportunities. But my question, second question was around the MR designation and I don't think you touched on that with green space and park space. Would that be in your way to answer that question? Can you just give us a little bit of an overview? It's on page 70 in your report. Because it was revised to the MO calculations. Am I mixing if I'm mixing up and that's the administration that should answer that? Uh, pardon what report are you looking at? That's page seventy of our document. Yeah. Seventy of five thirty four, so I don't know. There's a lot of pages here, so I yeah. might, it might be in another part of the uh, presentation. Oh. To speak to the green space is what I'm getting at. Yeah, page 14. Yeah, no. yeah 4.52. Okay. Okay. So through your worship, Councillor Barnhart, um, the MR was not um, changed in, the, in terms of land use. It was just us actually updating the land use statistics and making sure that they were accurate. Um, so the same amount of municipal reserve is being dedicated. It was just making um, typo and uh, updates. Can you speak a little bit to the uh, to the vision that you have for the for the green space in this area? Through your worship, Councillor Barnard, uh, we don't actually own any of the municipal reserve parcels. Landrix Ventures is only purchasing the property, um, the one point three nine hectare site. So you're not you're not building in any green space into your development, per se. Through your uh, through. Uh, <laughs> no, Your Worship, Councillor Barnhart. Um, so within our development, um, Dan did speak to some amenities that we would be creating. Um, there would be a small amenity area up uh, pergola, kind of fire pit state space as private amenities for the apartment and the townhouse people to use. Um, obviously, you can't restrict um, public versus private use, um, but there would be a small amount of green space in our site. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do you want to add? Yeah, to your worship, Councillor Barnhart, um, there's also the, the big tree stand to the east that we really want to um, leverage. A lot of trails there, so we want to incorporate that into the overall um, development. Councillor Stowe. Thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> um, I think the um, three of your worship to present us to Landrex. Um, I think the previous presentation referred to the fact that this parcel of land was currently sitting undeveloped because the proposal to build the original or assisted living um, development had not uh, gone ahead. So if we, and that's, and so at the moment, the only thing that's permitted is that assisted uh, or something like it is that assisted development living construction uh, building. Um, so um, if for some reason we weren't to pass this amendment, then I'm assuming that you would not be able to, to build what you've just proposed. Through your worship, Councillor Stout. Uh, so, uh, by us amending the ASP, we're just making it more flexible to allow a variety of um, developments. Um, so, administration spoke to this in that um, the land use bylaw does not restrict the type of use. So, assisted seniors living could be built in a medium density site. Yes. Um, it just right now, the ASP is very specific to the development that was previously proposed. So, if it's not changed, you can't build what you just proposed. Is that correct? Through your worship, Councillor Stout, that is correct. Okay, and then is is it then likely that it would remain undeveloped as a consequence? Through your worship, Councillor Stout, um, yes. Um, if the ASP was not amended, uh, Landrix could not proceed. So it would assume undeveloped. Okay, thank you. Councillor Magaswain. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I want to go along the lines of Councillor Barnhart's inquiries. Um, she said you, you got her there. I, I didn't quite um, didn't quite get it, so let me just ask it a, maybe a different way. The, the concern that I have here is there's a, you know, we're talking about assisted living seniors housing. There's a bunch of coulds and ifs and potentials, whereas bef 
previously it seemed pretty straightforward um, from residential support and assisted living, right? That's pretty clear cut um, to medium density residential where the coulds and the ifs and the, so the, the concern um, potentially, and so I'm hoping you can alleviate that for me is, um, you know, and maybe this is more of a bump on administrative question, but um, all things being considered, this this we could end up with absolutely no support for assisted living as part of if, if we change the designation. Is that correct? Uh, through your worship to Councillor, I'm sorry if I see your name, Munch, Munch Good enough. Yeah. Um, again, our units are accessible, so uh, our vision is to have the ability to have people age in place with home care because people can, there's there's the safeguards in place for them to, to age in place there. Um, as for future assisted living development, uh, that would have to be uh, looked at a zoning perspective and, uh, and what the demand is there potentially. I don't know. So maybe I'll ask it a different way. Uh, previously, um, it was required to be um, assisted living, mm -hmm. and now it's a potential. Is that, is that a fair summation? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Munchoff Swain, um, yes, that is um, correct, but I would direct your question to administration for clarification on both, like administration's direction. The, the intent of Landrix Ventures is to build an accessible development that incorporates intergenerational. Sure. Um, so, like we presented in our vision. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll save my questions then. Thanks for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Seeing no further questions for the presenter, thank you very much. And uh, I think it's a great vision for that site, and um, I'm hoping for a positive outcome here. Thank you. Um, next up would be are there any members of the public wishing to? Speak in favor of the bylaw. <laughs> Please go on down. State your name for the record. My name is Dennis Weller. I'm a part owner and project manager, developer of the subject site. Excuse me, Your Worship. I'm just writing my head. Yes, no worries. Um, just to give you some background, we, uh, I might answer your question, uh, uh, Councillor, that when we started this, my partners are, are doctors, they're specialists, so we didn't really have a vision for this site other than uh, we knew it was going to be multi-land use of some sort. And that was due to the uh, density requirements through the Regional Planning Commission. <clears throat> Consequently, uh, there was a zoning at that time, uh, I think it's UN, whatever, USR, USR, I believe. Uh, so that was, the, that was sort of the, dent, the zoning that we threw this parcel under. Um, we tried for well over a year after we did the ASP in dealing with Christensen and a number of other uh, uh, assisted living uh, people interests. Um, number one, the market wasn't there. Number two, the financing and programs weren't in place under the province. You have to be careful when you talk about assisted living in terms of definition, what you really mean by it. Uh, uh, there's that kind of assisted living where there's actually nurses, etc., on site, boom. And then there's the type of assisted living where, in fact, and I believe that Landrix has accomplished this, where the suites or units are, are user-friendly in terms of seniors, but you also can have home care come in, you can have meals brought in, they have kitchens, so there's, so there's lots of things there. That covers what a lot of people think is assisted living. Um, uh, the, the intent was never to have it in a situation where it was fully medicalized in terms of uh, full-time nurses, etc. That's a whole different bellywick altogether. Uh, the reality is we are losing seniors out of this city to Edmonton places because there is no place in this city for them. They want to downsize, they don't want to own, they don't want to buy a condominium, they boom. And so consequently, they're leaving our, our city. On the other side of the coin is we have an awful lot of young people that would like to stay in the city of Beaumont because their parents are here, etc. But there's no place for them to afford to really go without buying a condominium. Uh, a blend of seniors and, and young people is an ideal situation for our city. I mean, that's what we are out here. 
we're, we're a blend of the old and the new. And uh, this in no way, shape or form negates uh, uh, having care brought into the project. The other thing that's interesting too, there is no USR zoning any longer under our new bylaw. So this kind of falls under whatever it's being zoned now. Um, and the reality is there, down the road, if this was the only site available in Beaumont, okay, then I'd say, okay, maybe it's, it's sacrosanct, don't touch, but it's not. There's, there's a site on 30th Avenue, there's one in the west, and hopefully there'll be future ones to the east of us. So everything is market-driven in our industry. There is a market for this. It accommodates our seniors, it accommodates our young people. Uh, as, as Dan said, it's ideally situated for this type of a development. It truly is. And uh, I truly believe we'd be really remiss if, if we didn't allow this project to go ahead. Now, I obviously have a vested interest, but if it sits, it sits, I guess. But uh, as a resident in Beaumont, this meets a huge market void that, that isn't there now. And I have to tell you, I've dealt with a lot of people in my career. Landrex and Dan Rojak and his team of people have spent an awful lot of time with your administration and uh, gone looking at those very things that we talked about. So this isn't something that was done, oh yeah, I'll just buy the site. And this, uh, Landrex has been working on this for over a year. So I'd just like to let you know that. And thank you for your time. If you have any questions. No, I appreciate you coming them. in and speaking tonight. Um, if you're willing to ask questions, we'll throw the questions to the council. Thank you very much. Seeing none, thank you very much. Is there anybody else in attendance this evening that would wish to speak in favor? No? Are there anybody, is there anybody in attendance tonight that wishes to speak in opposition to the bylaw? Please. Come on down, please state your name for the record, and uh, there's a sign-in sheet there, too. Good evening. My name is Faye St. Louis. I'm the one that uh, Shalane had uh, read my letter and put it on the record. So it was great to hear some more of the development plans from Line Direct Ventures. Um, basically, I guess I'm still um, have a few questions, I guess, wondering in terms of is it purchasing that they're looking at people buying these places or they're looking at it in terms of rental property. Um, I guess it would be just keeping in mind even like low income seniors or people. You know what I mean? Like, I guess, what is their clientele that they're looking to get? Because I get that they're trying to do intergenerational living and having accessible dwellings. I'm just wondering more on affordability to people, as opposed to if it was just the residential supportive um, and assisted living designation. So I'm not sure if that's something they're able to answer at this point. Um, yeah, that's something you're, you would have to take up with them outside of this process. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going to discuss the, the land use amendment itself. The details of the project are... Right. Are, are yeah, those are just some things that came up as I was sitting there. But like I said, I was opposed to it just because the way it sounded in terms of having that residential support and assisted living accommodations in the southeast side because nothing else exists of that kind on the south side of the city. So I saw definite value in keeping it that way. Um, not only in terms of allowing people to age in place, but also as well for youth engagement with elders, you know, like nearby schools and things like that. So I think it's important that we have something that's dedicated to it because we are a growing population here. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to go to the city then they, to, you know, to age, I guess, if you want to say that. So having options that are closer maybe to their family still has the small town feel that they're able to get access to things that are nearby if they're able to walk to those kinds of places or not. Or like I said in my letter, if the Beaumont Transit ends up growing and coming down the hill, so to speak, along 50th Street, like it was originally sounding it was gonna um, go, then these people have more options for viability and getting around if they don't drive. So that's okay. pretty much what I was saying. All right. Um, just a quick question for you, because th this project seems to meet most of those concerns. Yeah. Well, no, that's just hearing about that part now. So that's great. Like okay. I said, to hear it, 
and because I didn't have that knowledge before. And like I said, I have the other questions and that would be something I'd have to Follow ask on the side. All right, great. Yeah. very much appreciate your comments this evening. Yeah. Is there anybody else in attendance tonight wishing to speak in opposition to the bylaw? Is there anybody in the audience tonight that deems themselves to be affected and who wishes to be heard? No? All right, so concluding statement from, from admin, if you wish to make one. We just carry on that second and third reading. All right, so at this point, we will declare the, the uh, public hearing closed and we'll move to second and third reading. So invite admit back to the back to the table to introduce second and third reading. Okay. Thank you, Your Worship, members of Council. Uh, second and third reading, um, I just wanted to take the time to provide some additional information in response to some of the concerns raised um, at this public hearing and at first reading that this amendment could have a negative impact on the development of seniors housing in Beaumont. So administration shares Council's awareness of the need for housing in Beaumont that is affordable and that is suitable for seniors. Uh, you may recall the stats that I said it earlier that 90% of dwellings in the city are three or more bedrooms, whereas 41% of households have two or fewer people. So I'll start by noting a couple of things regarding the land use framework, uh, planning framework for seniors oriented housing. In the land use bylaw, facilities such as retirement residences or assisted living developments are considered dwelling unit or human services uh, uses, depending on the level of care provided and the level of self-containment of the units if they have kitchenettes and such. These uses are permitted or discretionary uses in all of our residential zones. So they would be subject to the regular site development provisions of the land use bylaw and then any density or other requirements of the applicable area structure plan. So the key takeaway is that retirement residences and assisted living developments don't require specific designation or direction in an area structure plan. They're broadly permitted by our land use policies and regulations. Another point um, I'll offer is just uh, for comparison with area structure plans for other developing areas of the city, how um, various, various housing types have been handled. Uh, generally, our newer ASPs include direction to provide a greater range of housing types than historically has been offered in Beaumont, uh, but they tend to maintain flexibility on any specific site. So notably, the Lakeview Area Structure Plan, uh, adjacent to this one in Southeast Beaumont, was recently amended to include higher density residential that is, quote, intended predominantly for seniors housing, but may accommodate a multi-generational community as market demand dictates. <coughs> The Elon Area Structure Plan for the annexation lands on the west side of Beaumont provides direction for a variety of low and medium density residential development, including uh, a very variety of unit types, detached, semi-detached, row housing, stacked row housing, and low-rise apartments. And many of these medium density types could accommodate affordable or supportive housing. So to put it another, another way, uh, area structure plans and the land use bylaw provide land use policy and regulation for Beaumont. This land use framework broadly permits the development of assisted living and affordable housing types throughout residential areas of Beaumont. But to the extent that the city would like more of such housing to be available and it's not being provided by the current market, we may need to look at other policy tools beyond the land use framework to encourage it. So in recognition of this, the long range planning work plan for 2020 includes um, kicking off affordable housing and aging in place, aging in place strategies. And these are intended to ensure that our land use framework is complemented by other tools that can encourage the development of a full range of housing needed to support a community that is accessible and affordable at all stages of life. So in summary, admin is, administration is of the view that this amendment will not compromise the provision of affordable and seniors housing in Beaumont. It will offer the flexibility to provide such housing in a variety of forms. It's consistent with uh, municipal development plan policies that require new residential areas to provide a mix of housing options and services and facilities. But at the same time, administration recognizes that there is additional policy work to be done in addition to our land use framework to support the development of affordable housing. 
So with that in mind, uh, we ask Council to give second and third reading to this proposed amendment, or alternatively let us know how you'd like to proceed, and we'd be happy to take any other questions that you might have. Thank you very much. I appreciate that tonight. Um, as we've been through most of the presentation, is there a member of Council willing to move second reading? Councilor Margoswain. I'll move second reading. Discussion on the motion. Councilor Barnhart. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Your Worship, and to you. Um, a question. You mentioned the affordable housing and the um, aging in place strategies. When did you say they were going to be um, brought back to Council? Uh, they're, the actual or beginning of the projects themselves are on the work plan for 2020, so we'd begin them pending approval this year. So I, I guess that's where my concern is that the land that is ready now, we're not going to be able to use them for this and I, I understand that the grants in the market i understand those pressures but i'm just wondering if um are we talking five years 10 years 15 years how, how long before we might even see a project be able to go uh, come to fruition and you know i i do sit as you know on the housing uh, foundation board in the duke and i'm for the region i'm just concerned that we're have an opportunity here that's slipping out of our hands because we did see that we could go down this road now I understand the developers do have to uh, look at the market conditions. So can you give me some idea of looking five years, 10 years before we can get to a project that might serve this need? Thank you, Your Worship. Through to Councillor Barnhart. Uh, the housing, uh, the affordable housing strategy and the aging in place strategy are going to enable the future development. Now, a lot of this is actually going to take place through developers and will enable that framework for how we're going to pursue those in the future. Right now, we don't have any specific projects that are envisioned that would take place under this plan. Uh, this plan will take place over 2020 and um, will be done, you know, in short order, I would say after that. We do have other opportunities that we are pursuing within Beaumont to look at how we can partner with other people to do affordable housing. So that opportunity is not lost. It's just that this one was not, um, this one was developer driven for a very specific proposal in mind, but and the area structure plan was just so specific and so restrictive that we're just loosening it to allow for more flexibility at this point. Correct me if I'm wrong. Don't we have three or four parcels that if, the somebody wanted to come buy them and put in a support living project however long it would take to plan it they could put a shovel in the ground tomorrow if it was so that ready uh, thank you your worship yes in uh safe the plash alarus neighborhood we do own about three hectare three acre parcel um correct me i'm not quite certain on that size off the top of my head we'll but we do own that parcel that if somebody were wanting to put forward that proposal it is in an area that already uh would permit that so would enable that flexibility to occur in a more timely fashion without needing some of this so yes we do have other opportunities so, for that so if a developer wanted to come in and do it there is space currently existing and it could happen relatively quickly that's possible thank you councillor my Swain. Thank you, Worship, uh, and thanks for the background explanation. Um, just being careful of the, the public hearing process and not wanting to say too much prior to get into that. We're now we're in second uh, and third reading here. Um, just want to also acknowledge the, the presenters there for providing that, that detailed uh, uh, presentation. I think it's incredibly exciting for, for Bob Want to be able to take advantage of that space and, and clearly meets a, a need that we have here in the community. Um, I, I too had uh, some concerns um, just from reading it, right? And you only get so much out of it. Um, but hearing the presentation and, and the vision um, and uh, incredibly well explained. So thank you for doing that. So um, I will be uh, in, su in support of this and really looking forward to uh, some shovels in the ground. So thank you. Awesome. Seeing no further requests for oh, Councillor Dan, look. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, thank you for the presentation from both administration and uh, the interested parties, including the lady who spoken against the bylaws. It's hard to come here and speak against the bylaws, so thank you for doing that. Much appreciated. One quick question. I sometimes ask administration these kind of complex bylaw amendments is, I've got enough information to make a decision based on what I've read and what I heard tonight. Is there anything about this bylaw amendment that administration feels it would be a negative, that we need to be aware of, there's any reason why we wouldn't do this? I've asked that question numerous times before in different situations, so I want to ask it again tonight. I don't see anything glaringly uh, apparent that we shouldn't do this, but there's something I may be missing perhaps or a subtle thing that we need to be at least be aware of anyhow. Thank you. I would say, I would say no. 
I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, you one second, we're having a small technical glitch. We lost Councillor Van Newkirk, so we're just going to take a quick pause, get him back, and then. Great when it works, but <laughs> are you there, Counselor? <laughs> Counselor Van Newkirk, can you hear us? Because we can't hear you. Yes, I got you again. Sorry. Cool. Thank you very much. All right. So, seeing no further uh, questions or requests to speak, call the question. All in favor of second reading? Councillor Van Newkirk. In favor. That carries unanimously. Is there a member of council or sir? Is there <coughs> is there a member of council willing to move third reading? Councillor Stout. I am willing to move third reading, Your Worship. But don't we need to? Do unanimous consent? No, nope. yeah, because we're going to do whatever want. We'll move for third reading then, yes. Thank you very much. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? In favor. And that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Appreciate all your hard work this evening. Yeah, please. All right, that brings us to item 7A, uh, an update on the Beaumont Sport Recreation Center. John? Evening Council. Uh, I am Mike Blitzky. I am the contract administrator and rep representative for BR2 Architecture for the pro project. So, and, uh, good evening, Your Worship, and members of Council. Ian Franklin, Parks and Facilities Manager, and Mike B is here tonight to give the presentation as follows. So, I uh, see so we, uh, we threw together another. PowerPoint seemed to work well last time. Give you guys a visual, see how far it's come. So let's move through that. If you've got any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, as you can see on the outside of the building here, on, on this first page, we're, uh, we're nearly closed all the way in. Uh, the roof is sealed, the main field house and arena. Somebody want to go kick that door? <laughs> all right, thanks. <laughs> I really didn't mean one of the audience, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, sorry. Uh, so yes, uh, we're we're almost completely sealed in. Uh, the the last little portion here is this uh, this front vestibule, uh, which they have warded off, and you can see they've got some stuff work going up and some roofing. Um, the the canopy there is also being completed. Uh, the roof on the other side of the building is the field house. Doesn't have cladding on it yet, but it's all insulated and and finished up there as well. Uh, we're about 17 months into the 22 months construction schedule, about 80% complete and progress billing. Uh, we've been spent about 70% of the 1 million contingency. And uh, as I said before, the building uh, envelope is nearly complete and we have, now that the pool is shut down, we've been able to get in there and start the work in, in the existing. Uh, so this uh, this view here is in the front entrance, just past our reception desk, uh, kind of looking into the the uh, climbing wall area. And that rounded bulkhead you're seeing at the end is actually the new entrance for the pool. Once you walk in through the main, uh, this is kind of a view of the the window and door going into the arena right off of the vestibule entrance. 
And here you can see the, a little, a little hard to tell with the, the darkness of the screen here, but uh, all, the ceiling is all painted. The uh, the big steel beams are, are now painted. Uh, the duct work, the, the painting in the arena is pretty much done. We have the structural slab in, and the, the one of the last major portions we have going on in here is the actual ice slab. Should be all the tubing and, and all that stuff. And then we have another piece of concrete going on top of that. So we get our ice slab going. Uh, here's just a small shot of the uh, one of the change rooms. Uh, they're all painted, ceilings are in. Uh, those boxes there you can see are, are tiles, so they're starting to tile the showers and whatnot and get those all prepared. Uh, we've got, they're starting to prep for flooring in a good chunk of the building now too, so. Uh, this is another shot down the main floor corridor, uh, going down to, kind of between the arena dressing rooms. I uh, see we got some some bulkhead installation going on in there. They should be starting ceiling grids down in down in this area as well. Uh, here we have our gymnasium. You see us. Uh, Painted, painted all the concrete block there. We put it all boarded up at top. Uh, you can see up top that large window there is one of the windows looking down from one of the multi-purpose rooms on the second floor. Uh, those little alcoves are going to be uh, cubbies and storage for people's uh, clothes or just, uh, shoes or whatever they have in there. Uh, this is a view from the running track, looking down onto what will be the the sports field and the field house. Uh, you'll see it's all it's all covered in plastic, and that's because they're they're doing the uh, the painting in there right now. They're covering all the all of it to get the ceiling done. Uh, it's another kind of different shot. You can shot you get more of the the bleachers in there, and you can see the work on the other side. It's the expanded fitness that has large windows looking out into the field house and the track. Uh, here we have our, our uh, food, our concession spaces, uh, which we have one vendor in for now, and we're looking to fit him up to get him ready for opening day. Uh, so we have them boarded up, not quite painted yet. Uh, another view, kind of looking down the hallway towards, that would be towards the arena, where you get uh, the, the bleacher uh, and seating for the arena. Uh, so this is a an overhead door that we have in the expanded fitness. Uh, it's in the new part of the building, and in the kind of the very back there, where you see it's a little lighter, uh, is the ramp going down into the the existing fitness area that was already there. So it'll be all uh, very free accessible to go from one to the other. And this is a view from the guardrail in the arena looking down. And you can see they've got uh, some of the glazing going in now. It's the, the rail in front there for, uh, for easy viewing. You're watching hockey. And this is inside of that uh, expanded fitness in the second floor. Uh, so those are, the, again, the, the windows looking out into the field house. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, have plug-ins and stuff along that wall so people can be sitting on their bikes and whatnot and looking out and seeing what's going on in the running track and the field house. This would be a large, really nice, large uh, seamless glass uh, in there, so it should look pretty sharp. And this is some of the work that started construction into the, this is actually the existing uh, reception and lobby area of the pool. Uh, so we've got some uh, uh, an event room going in there and, and divvying it up a bit, so it's kind of the stuff work uh, starting to go up in there now, now that uh, Clark has access. And... Uh, there's our, our front entrance from the, uh, the first slide there again. So again, we're all sealed and almost all the way closed in. That's it. Well, thank you very much for coming in. We really do appreciate the update. This is a really exciting project in our community. And so I'll, I'll ask the million dollar question that everybody wants to know. Are we on time and on budget? <laughs> Uh, Yet, yeah, to the best of our knowledge, uh, Clark has told us that they are still on track for the, uh, the July 15th oh, finish open. date. Yeah. Substantial. <laughs> Are there questions from members of council? Councilor Mark Oswald. Thank you, and, and I think, uh, I don't know if you're watching, but my smile was getting bigger and bigger and bigger just watching that um, as the slides come on. It's great to see the progress, uh, as the mayor mentioned, very exciting project. Um, <clears throat> maybe just a point of clarification. Uh, so you said project construction complete. July 15. I wonder if maybe administration just want to confirm on when we think we might be opening this to the public, just to clarify that that date. Uh, those are two different dates. So if you could just maybe provide a bit of clarification on that. 
You want this one? You want the CEO to take this one? CEO. You don't need to give me a specific date, but just just to clarify, what needs to happen from when it's handed over to us? Um, just for sure, and, and, and Mr. Franklin, feel free to, to jump in. When we originally laid out the, the project, we were targeting a uh, uh, post um, September long weekend, so it gives us a X number of days to get used to the systems and get it up and running. But I'll let Mr. Franklin finish that up if you'd like. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through Mayor Stewart to Councillor Marcus Swain. Yeah, um, we, we are looking at substantial completion by the date uh, stated by BR2, um, and then just getting into the building, and then obviously with creating ice and doing various things that need to be done in order to get things going and to get staff uh, comfortable, familiar with the site, um, orientations to all the new equipment and all the new aspects of the facility um, are gonna happen within a few week period after that to allow for successful opening. Cast down there. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to our presenter for coming to see us again. I know, Council, you know, our role is to sort of set policy and set objectives and set capital, and administration executes through our contractors and all that. But it's really great to have you come in front of us and let us know business at home how the project's coming along. As Councilman Cosway mentioned, the excitement in the community is huge right now, and it's getting more and more shape, it's coming more to fruition. So you're coming in front and letting us know how we're doing. It's very important to us as a council and administration as well. So thank we're still looking forward to seeing you again, hopefully in the near future, to give us an update as we're going along. But I like those pictures. Uh, it's, it is very exciting, and uh, we're, we're very excited about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Barnard. Thank you, Worship, and thank you for the update. Great to see you on time and on budget. That's what we love to hear. Um, and my question is if you're taking bookings already for the facility or are you waiting until July? <laughs> uh, thank you. I threw your worship to Councillor Barnhart. Um, right now, um, th that'd be more on the programming realm of sides um, as we're more the building facility operation, but we can definitely uh, talk to administration so and get your answer. Contact the town, the city office? Yeah, the booking, the booking clerk. Um, they can answer all related okay. questions to bookings. I know people are anxious to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no further requests, I once again really appreciate it. Really exciting, and, and thanks for coming in and spending 10, 10 minutes with us tonight to uh, show us the update. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, so that brings us to item 8A, Regional Transit Services Commission Phase 2. He jokes, he jokes. Not very That's good. That's good. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's all in one big package, but so what's going to happen now is uh, we're going to see a presentation on the last of the, on the final report. Uh, administration is going to walk us through their recommendation, and there are two motions we need to make tonight um, that are part of our package, and we'll get to those. And uh, yeah, we're going to decide whether or not we're going to join the Regional Transit Commission by the time we're done this segment of the meeting. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship and Council and members of the public. My name is Tika Brown. I'm a senior planner with the City of Beaumont. And with me here this evening is Alan Tom, associate partner with Ernst & Young, here to present the final report, Accelerating Transit in the Edmonton Metropolitan Region. Prepared in collaboration with Beaumont and 12 other regional municipalities over the past year, uh, this report was re released to the public on January 22nd. Today, the decision in front of Council is whether to continue to, conti to continue to participate in the Regional Transit Services Commission initiative, provided that strategic alignment and feasibility of the Commission for the City of Beaumont and the region is maintained. As Council is aware, this initiative is evolving in real time. As of this afternoon, seven municipalities have voted to continue to participate one municipality has voted to not continue to participate, and three communities have yet to vote, but will vote in early March. Mr. Tom is prepared to speak broadly about what the voting outcomes may mean for the region and the City of Beaumont. 
Before Mr. Tong provides the details of the final report, I'd like to highlight some key considerations that informed administration's recommendation to support further work on this initiative. Better transit supports key strategic pillars established by Council in our Beaumont Municipal Strategic Plan. The Regional Transit Services Commission is an opportunity to collectively look at mobility in the region across municipal boundaries. It provides better transit services for less costs and supports key strategic initiatives at the regional scale. The City of Beaumont would see extended service hours, higher frequency service, and additional direct destinations for less than transit costs the city today at a local scale. Once all the communities have voted, those who decide to participate will submit a joint application to the province asking to establish a Regional Transit Services Commission through provincial regulation. If Council chooses to support further participation in standing up the Commission, the next steps include working with other municipalities to revise the business case to reflect the communities who have decided to move forward, detailed work around capital assets, contracts, operational components, and public engagement. An application will be made to the Government of Alberta in the spring, and regulatory uh, a regulatory decision by the Government of Alberta is expected by December 2020, allowing for the standing up of the Commission by 2021, which will include the new Regional Commission Board. I'll now hand it over to Mr. Tom. Uh, Council will have an opportunity for questions to administration and Alan after his presentation before you vote. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having me back. Uh, a couple of things to note when we go through this presentation package is it's presenting on the final report. Our report was done working with the municipalities to build a commission that had all 13 municipalities in the region uh, joining it. Sorry. Just wait for this to get back up. No, must have hit something. Um, so, we know from the voting so far that one municipality today has joined, chosen not to join, that's Strathcona County. I will go through, as I go through the material provided here, I'll provide some high-level commentary on how we think that impacts the region today based on that decision. What I point out is there is a process uh, between when municipality is done voting, which is up until March 10th, through to the point the application is made to the government for that business case to be reviewed, to be reassessed, has been mentioned based on the participants who vote. Uh, yes to join versus those who don't and then that would uh, be taken a look at by the transition team in terms of determining the viability both from a transit service delivery model and from a financial model. So those decisions will come uh, once we know how everybody votes in the inland. So I will try and put the commentary over this as I can uh, at a high level as we progress uh, through this information. So just in terms of background, uh, this started with the mayors around the region signing on to MOU back in November or so, October of 2018, to take a look at developing a regional transit commission. So since then, transition team members, working team members, administration have, uh, have had representatives from councils across all 30 municipalities, transit specialists, government relations, administration, working to bring what you have here in front of you today. Uh, to help build that process. So really the focus has been around managing the cost of delivering transit, uh, governing decisions effectively, and delivering a better integrated service. So our report covered off an operating model, the strategy, the vision, the mission, uh, what the transit service delivery would look like around the region conceptually, the costs of that delivery, how costs would be allocated around the region, certainly a governance model to dictate how decisions get made across the municipalities and how operations are handled, and finally an implementation plan. So I'll go through some of the high-level components of that here today. From a case for change, there's two primary areas that drive it. One is meeting current and future mobility needs, and the other area around why you would do this now in the case is around using resources more efficiently. So why around current and future mobility? Making transit services accessible to all 13 municipalities today, not all 13 in the region have transit. For some, uh, the cost bearing to starting transit is too significant. Uh, the ability in the past to get a grant for a bus is one thing, but to be able to operate that bus is a, is a different matter altogether. So making that service accessible, this plan does allow all 13 municipalities in the region to have transit. Improving the connectivity of transit services and increasing the quality of intramunicipal transit services, again, two closely connected pieces, making a more efficient use of interlining, allowing ridership to have continuous trips, 
uh, increasing that quality so it's a consistent experience across the region for riders that how they get on a bus in one area is similar to how they get off the bus, what first kilometer, last kilometer, and other mobility options look like uh, for consistency. Keeping transit services relevant, agile, and customer-focused. Uh, again, and attracting people and business investment. So we know from studies that have been conducted around North America <clears throat> that when you have one seamless integrated transit commission versus eight or nine today transit agencies or years down the road, possibly 12 or 13, uh, that that attracts people because there's integration and easier mobility and more connectivity and it attracts business investment as businesses don't have to deal with multiple agency providers or they know there's an increased focus in moving people around the region for employment purposes. In terms of using resources more efficiently, uh, our study has shown that you can realize efficiency savings by integrating services uh, without reducing service of about 5.5 million per year does cost more to create a transit commission and operate a transit commission. So that nets out to about 3.4 million a year in savings by 2026. And I'll point out at this point in time that the commission looks to reinvest those savings into enhancing transit services around the region. Uh, but as I'll talk about later in the governance model, ultimately that becomes a board decision. So whether or not those savings are uh, returned back to the municipalities at a later point in time will depend upon the needs of, of transit in the region. Increased flexibility to match transit demand with fleet capacity. So municipalities will make investment decisions on the rolling stock based upon their specific needs, but doesn't necessarily optimize the use of those assets. When you look at deploying a fleet across the region, again, allows to smooth the infrastructure and investment costs, uh, increasing the utilization of the fleet. Improving ability to perform transit planning alongside land use and transportation. So as population densities continue over the next 10 or 20 years, uh, as transportation corridors tighten, space becomes more valuable, uh, the space between municipalities disappears and there's only a dotted line on a map. The ability to integrate the transit planning and delivery of mobility services with those corridor plannings becomes uh, more key and easier to accomplish under commission. Reducing the complexity and effort to coordinate and deliver, deliver transit across 13 municipalities and concentrating expertise. A lot of great transit planners and transit delivery groups across the region. But being able to bring that skill set together for the benefit of the entire region certainly is an opportunity as well. So the transition team made up of uh, representatives from council of each municipality got together and really highlighted seven main strategy areas. Uh, on the left, I'd say the three that were focused on the most in the early stages of development was customer experience, service delivery, and fiscal responsibility. So let's make sure that our customers don't see a decrease in service, a decline in the service quality that they're getting now, and for those that get transit services that we're providing something that's meaningful and valuable. Service delivery, so making sure it's integrated and accessible, efficient, effective, and then fiscal responsibility. Municipalities want to know, is this going to cost me more? Is there going to be burden put on us because we're doing it through a commission as opposed to our current structure? Is it going to cost less? What do we do if it's going to cost less? And how are we going to share those costs transparently? So those were the three main areas, not that the other remaining uh, four aren't important. I think the only thing I'd highlight really around the vision, mission, and strategy or, and purpose would be the mission. So to enable a variety of sustainable mobility options that best serve our region's people and communities. So variety and sustainable are keys. Today it's bus, but what's it gonna be in five years? Car share, ride share are already out there. You have you know, scooters and bikes, but as you integrate all of those and the unknowns 10 years or 20 years out, the commission is much more better positioned to integrate those services and provide those across the region. Uh, again, to evolve and make sure that they're best serving the region's people and communities. So we built a conceptual transit map for the region. What I highlight around transit is today, uh, it would be regional routes that come into the commission and then all municipalities, local services that deliver local transit today with the exception of ETS. So moving in, everybody's local uh, and all the regional routes, ETS moves in about 12% of their service. That's considered regional. They do retain the rest of their local service. That service would come in at a later point in time. We could talk about how that service comes in. The main reason for doing it staggered uh, is so that the commission has an opportunity to develop, develop and establish itself as a regional commission suiting the needs of regional mobility uh, as opposed to the large volume of local service that ETS has. So when you take a look at the map, what it does allow is to connect you know, areas such as Morinville coming in, which doesn't have service today, into the region. Uh, under this map, uh, you would look at some connections between, uh, between Fort Saskatchewan and Sherwood Park. Uh, given Strathcona's decision at this point in time, that route would be in jeopardy. When it comes to Beaumont, you see service that would come in from the future of Millwood Station up into Beaumont, crosses over into Nisku through the bottom, uh, Regional Express number four, continues on into Devon and brings itself down into Atchison, connecting that southeast to southwest corridor. 
uh, bringing in Str uh, Stony Plain into transit through Spruce Grove and into the corridor as well. And then ability for future routes that start to connect Meadows into Millwoods and really integrate into future LRT. You see the regional routes where before they would come in from municipalities, and I'll, I'll pick on St. Albert for a moment, they would come in from, say, St. Albert and come into the downtown core of Edmonton and then turn around and go back to their community and pick up people again and bring them in and not look at two-way traffic. We're continuing that service across the region. It was a lot of efficiency and a lot of effectiveness that way. So being able to integrate those services, run more continuous routes, create uh, less overlap of services that there has been in the past. You'd have two systems buses running side by side. That's really the value of creating uh, the regional map. So we've done that here. The implications of Strathcona not being in uh, do have impacts on some of the eastern corridors with Rapid 1 that comes out to Bethel and Rapid 2 that comes out to Ord. So there would certainly be some reconfiguration of routes that we'd work through with the transition team members, uh, but certainly it doesn't stop the value creation of a regional commission the Transit Commission when you take a look at the pattern of mobility across the region. Uh, so we do see about 1,540 hours of savings today when we take a look at this model. We've set aside some pretty solid contingencies, about 700 service hours in case we need to increase the frequency of buses or increase the size as you look at uh, consolidating some routes and making sure that passenger comfort is still maintained. Uh, so we run about 850 hours a week of savings. That drives about the 5.5 million uh, hours a year. Now with Strathcona and I'll move on actually I'll move on to the cost and I'll talk about the implications there so we built the funding model that takes a look at building up the cost around the commission we started with the base case of delivering transit services across the region today so the municipalities provided us the cost of delivering transit we take that and then we're adding in the cost of running a commission so we've got one time and startup costs in the second row anywhere from 864,000 in 2020 peak at 1.8 million in 2021 they disappear in 2023 those tend to be more around the cost of the detailed route planning in 2021, uh, the beginning of the integration of the services. We have costs in there that allow for a significant about a half a million dollars in terms of stakeholder engagement across the municipalities that decide to participate in, in the commission. And we all understand the route requirements and the ridership patterns and what is needed from residents and, and stakeholders in the region. Other aspects around branding. Uh, and then we have recurring and incremental costs that runs anywhere from 17,000 in 2020 to a pretty steady state of about 2.1 million you'll see in 2024 to 2026. Those costs stay with the commission. So once you create the commission, they're around. Uh, largely they have some incremental staffing cost in them. Running the commission is larger than individual municipalities. Most municipalities, their transit agencies have had the value of using internal corporate services groups. The commission has to stand on its own when it comes to financial, legal, procurement, HR, etc. So additional costs in there. Uh, and then we have service efficiency. So those comes off the incremental costs. 5.5 million in 2026 when everything is integrated. We recognize those, those savings coming in gradually over time, starting in 2022 at about 1.7 million. And gradually increasing to 5.5 in 2026, recognizing that it takes time to integrate services, takes time to bring those efficiencies together without creating upheaval in the system. Ultimately, what it culminates to is the green boxes in the bottom right. So by 2024, the savings outweigh the incremental costs uh, for about 1.4 million. And by 2026, we get 3.4 million of savings over and above the incremental cost. So the commission can save 3.4 million a year in terms of delivery by 2026 for comparable services. Again, the question comes into at this point, they're being held within the commission to recover the incremental and the one-time cost of the beginning. Going forward, reinvested back into transit or returned to the municipalities, depending on the board's decision. Uh, ultimately, the bottom right, 767,000 in the yellow box, that shows that by 2026, all of the one-time startup and recurring incremental costs have been recovered. So it breaks even by 2026, then is able to provide those savings going forward of 3.4 million a year. The implications with Strathcona is well, certainly Strathcona provided about 26% of the total hours in the commission, uh, second largest transit provider in the region. But from a regional perspective, in terms of the regional routes that we showed previously on the map, they were about eight or nine percent of the total regional service. So what that means is they had significant local transit hours because they were moving their local services and they had some unique services they required as enhanced transit services for their residents that were not part of the regional network. Uh, and so while they're the second largest provider, the impact of the region is about eight percent of service hours. Certainly there would be efficiency savings that would uh, be lost because they do have integrating routes that come up from Strathcona and Sherwood Park into Edmonton. 
uh, for the region, but at the same time, there were significant contingency hours set aside for the level of service that they have and making sure that that service would be supported. So while some of the efficiency savings will go down, the offsets will reduce as well on that. Uh, in addition, we would expect some of the one-time and startup costs to go down and the recurring in incremental costs in terms of staffing to have see a reduction as well, given the size of the commission overall would be decreasing. So while I don't have numbers to provide to you today, and we would relook at those numbers once all the voting concludes at the uh, uh, after March 10th, uh, the commission will still be financially viable in terms of being able to return savings either back into transit or back into municipalities in, in some fashion. We'll have to go through that process still to confirm that dollar value uh, which will be somewhere less than the 3.4 million. This table is meant to reflect the cost allocations across the municipalities. So before municipalities are paying for their transit services, now the commission will manage the cost and will charge that back out to the municipalities. So there's managed across four different cost streams. The first being a base fee, which is a fixed component and then a variable component based on population. Second is a regional service allocation. So that is for the contribution towards regional routes. Uh, primarily based on where those routes run through and what communities they pass through. There's a local service allocation. What that means is municipalities that have local service pay for their local service. Uh, whatever the cost of delivering it is, is the municipalities paying for that 100% on their own. They have the ability to determine the service levels that are associated with that service, scaling it up or down as required. Uh, special projects regarding the local service. I think the only time the commission would look at uh, take a look at the level of service as if it would have a negative impact on the regional network itself, but local service is the purview of the municipalities. And finally, an enhanced service allocation. An enhanced service allocation is meant to reflect where municipalities want something more than the commission would typically deliver, something very specific. Certainly, they're able to do that, ask the commission for it, work out the cost and pay for that directly. So four types of service of cost allocations really to make sure municipalities understand what are we paying for, how are we paying for it, and the question that always comes up, are we heavily, heavily subsidizing somebody else or are we paying an appropriate share? So that's the cost allocations. Here's the way they work over the first five years of the business case. It starts in 2022 because over 2020 and 2021, municipalities continue to deliver their transit services. As you saw in a timeline earlier, commission likely gets stood up legally by the end of 2020. It needs to establish itself and put in all of its, op get ready for operations in 2021. And it'll start to transfer operation of transit in, in 2022. So that's the requisition start from the commission in 2022. You can see Beaumont anywhere from 314,000 in 2022 through to 334,000 in 2026, an average of $324,000 over the five year period. About 0.56%, so less than 1% of the total system cost today, that will change. You can see Edmonton at 42%, Strathcona County at 26% in the business case, uh, and St. Albert at 19%. So the percentages will shift but it gives you an idea as to the total contribution requisition. Now, where does that fit compared to what you're paying for transit services today? Because you do deliver transit services right now. So that works about to an average of $82,000 less per year compared to what you're spending on transit today. Uh, and when we think to the transit services that are being provided, and we go back up to the, to the map, and we take a look in the bottom around this regional express number four route that connects both to Nisku and comes down into Edmonton and then further on to the core, uh, there you're looking at all day service, uh, weekdays and weekends with peak service on the weekdays. Uh, so there's an increase in service level. The peak services are about 30 minute, uh, peak is 30 minute and then all day service is 60 minute and weekend service is 60 minute cycle. So uh, you end up spending less and you end up having more connectivity in terms of service and then a greater connectivity to, uh, to the regional network. Uh, so that's where that's where your costing sits and, and for an understanding you you end up paying in terms of the cost allocations uh, for Beaumont. You have a base fee, uh, you don't have any local service allocation because it's regional routes, you have a regional service component and you have no enhanced services. So really you're dealing with regional transit at that point in time. So governance, uh, the question comes up, how do we know we're not going to just incur more costs in the second, third or fifth or seventh year? Uh, how do we know that we don't lose full autonomy over the level of our transit services? And ultimately that comes down to two things, the governance model for the board and also service level guidelines. So service level guidelines have been drafted already there in our report. They're meant to be a comprehensive document that talks about service expectations, stop spacing frequencies, load capacities, etc. They've been drafted, they're not finished. The transition team and ultimately the commission will finish those, but those really become the playbook, so to speak, of how transit is delivered. 
The, the board governance is the other aspect. So how the governance structure will work uh, based on the transition team recommendations is that each municipality that joins the commission will have one seat at the board that will be an elected official from council nominated by the municipality. Each municipality gets one vote. So the vote is not based on population size. Uh, it's not based on some tax value or anything like that. One vote per municipality. So in this case today, we'd be dealing with a maximum of 12. There's two decision structures, a simple majority and double majority. So simple majority is 50% plus one, which would be seven out of 12 municipalities are needed to pass a simple majority decision. The more complex decisions, which focus around financial, uh, the finan annual long-term financial plans, capital investments, uh, the um, strategic plans, those elements all require double two-thirds majority. So the per first pass is two-thirds of municipalities, one vote per municipality votes yes. Uh, which would be eight of 13 uh, municipalities. And then the second pass, should that be successful, is two thirds of the weighted average cost. So in this case, that would mean Edmonton. Edmonton would have to approve essentially any vote that has already been approved from the eight of the 13 municipalities, but it does not work the other way around. So there's not one municipality or small group of municipalities that can drive a decision. It takes eight municipalities to approve annual operating plans to approve the annual budgets, to approve the strategic plan, capital investments, et cetera. So it does strike a balance, we feel, between uh, recognizing that uh, there needs to be a decision-making ability and that municipalities want to make sure that they don't have costs forced on them, for example. I think that uh, for most municipalities, what's negative to one is going to be negative to many. So there's some fairly common parameters being able to have eight municipalities out of 13 to make a decision. Uh, so it requires that double majority. In 24 months, the board composition and approach has to be reviewed to take a look at its board size, composition, efficiency, uh, and ability to support continuous improvement. 12 member board is fairly large. Uh, so it just needs to make sure the, the rule is there to make sure that it's functioning appropriately and looking for recommendations uh, if there are any for improvements. Business case, last thing we talked about a lot around the financial account and the transit user account and how transit or services are delivered. Uh, through the provider, but three other main areas that we hear about as we work through municipalities, the community, the economic, and the environmental. So community account, allowing people to live, work, play, learn where they want, not seeing your residents have to move away for work or education purposes. If over time we can increase the mobility. Transit in the region today is about getting people in and out of the downtown core, largely for downtown employment purposes or education purposes. It's not so much around moving people around the region to the adjoining communities and enabling a broader employment and workforce. So the community account is meant to recognize that need uh, and have less reliance on personal vehicles and not have to have that cost. So certainly the commission is uh, more, value than in, more valuable than independent transit agencies in terms of accomplishing that task because of integrated transit planning. We spoke earlier about the economic account, uh, the interest of uh, business and investment to see integrated regional transit that is coordinated and effective and thinks about moving people for education and employment purposes around a region and then the environmental account. So yes, it is meant to help reduce congestion on the roads, reduce the need for cars, give people the options. Uh, and so over time, being able to reduce those emissions, manage those assets across the network and reduce that waste. So positive there again, because of integrated planning. So just to summarize, uh, conceptual transit services, provide improved services while achieving service efficiencies through that regional network. Net savings realized about 3.4 million per year in 2026. Yes, that number will adjust, but it will still there will still be positive savings. Uh, we can recover the startup and operating costs by then as well. Annual contributions by municipalities are estimated to be comparable to the forecasted cost of delivering your own transit services, or cheaper. Where it's more, it's because municipalities are looking to deliver more services. Uh, as well, and a governance model that really respects member municipalities' voice in that decision making while allowing the commission to manage its mobility on a regional level. So, with that, take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Randy. We appreciate you coming in tonight and uh, really do appreciate all the work that the, the transition team has done and Ian Y has done to put in to get us all to this point. And I'd like to thank Councillor Monkoff Swain who has ably represented us through the, this whole process and he's kept it as well up to date and well informed of the processes that have gone on at the Transit Commission or the transition the transition team and, and kept us going so that we were well informed to make the decisions tonight. Um, as I sit here and reflect though, this is one of those projects that, that comes along once in a lifetime. This is a truly transformative effect and one of the things that we've been grappling with at the EMRB has been how do we plan for the next million people and how do we uh, 
increase the sustainability and the future potential of our metro region, uh, making an attractive location for investment and to build new economic opportunities. Um, and so that is, and that's one, and this is one of those one of those key pieces that will allow us to move people around this region so that we can get to those employment centers and we can get and we can continue to be borderless. Um, and that takes big leadership. And so for the other municipalities have already voted yes. Awesome, great for see great to see that they have a big vision. I'm hoping we get there tonight too. Um, so at that time, I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you very much, Councilor Magasway. Yeah, thank you, and, and um, I'm yeah, clearly very excited to be at this point today. Uh, I'll make maybe a few acknowledgements um, that I wanted to to get to first, and then I'll look up for other councillors to ask questions. So. Um, Thanks for your words. Uh, certainly a privilege to be part of the, the team, the transition team there, um, and I appreciate council um, having faith in me to work through all the challenges associated with something this, uh, uh, with a massive task like this. Um, to Alan and the EY team, thanks. Uh, certainly, um, you know, you, you pulled this off, um, really incredible job to, to get us through this. The expertise that you were able to bring into the room and the communication that you had it back out to the team was, uh, was very well done. So um, crucial step to getting us here today. I think uh, you know, with projects such as this, as soon as misinformation comes out there, that's when people like us up here get start getting nervous and, and make um, poor decisions. So thanks for keeping us in line. Um, also, want to acknowledge the twelve uh, um, colleagues from neighbouring municipalities, a part of the process, who um, I'll say for the most part uh, really came in and, and took their uh, took their local hats off uh, and, and really came in with a what's best for the region attitude. We talk about this a lot um, across the different EMRB boards and that sort of thing, and um, you know, I, I really felt, uh, really felt that that presence there in the room, and and specifically to Councillor Walters and uh, Councillor Broadhead from City of Edmonton and Saint Albert. Um, you know, this this really started with with Saint Albert and Edmonton coming together and having a discussion about this doesn't make sense to Alan's point before of Saint Albert coming in and then driving a bus back the other way. Uh, but the vision from those two municipalities to say, hey, you know, this is an opportunity for us to, to go region wide uh, and, and a real chance to bring in some of the, the regional partners. So um, appreciate the vision on that. Um, lastly, uh, special acknowledgement to, to two staff uh, who worked tirelessly, tirelessly through this. Um, as per normal, uh, administration does all the work um, in the background and hopes politicians don't mess it up. Um, so. Tika and Alyssa, um, who represented us in the background, you girls, uh, women, were amazing. Um, you represented Beaumont so well, uh, and the amount of councillors and administrative staff who came up to me, sought me out and said, you know, you're lucky you've got these these folks here in the room, uh, was, was really uh, awesome to hear. And, and I think it's a really big step change for us as Beaumont, where we, you know, this council tried to be um, go out there and, and be viewed a little bit different in the region um, and to, to have other people actively seek uh, me out to, to share the feedback on, on you two for the work that you've done and, and shown that we are we were a real leader in this uh, was great to, to see. So thanks for both again for your efforts um, and uh, looking forward to further discussion on this. All right, so from a process perspective, we'll, we'll get back to, to questions on the final report and, and, and moving there. Uh, we'll get into debate when we get to the two recommendations after questions. So does it, do we have questions for the presenters tonight on the final report or anything on the business case, the financials, or are we ready to move some recommendations? Okay, I see no questions for admin. Just a testament to how well we've been kept informed up through the whole thing. Uh, we have two recommendations ahead of us tonight. The first one being that council support the application to the government of Alberta to establish a regional transit services commission within provincial regulation with the city of Beaumont as a member of the commission based on the proposed governance, financial and operating models for the commission consistent with the recommendations in the Ernst & Young report entitled Accelerating Transit in the Edmonton Metropolitan Region, Building a Regional Transit Services Commission. And a second motion that we have to pass tonight, that council direct administration to continue pre-implementation work to stand up the commission, provided that the strategic alignment and feasibility of the commission for the city of Beaumont and the region is maintained. So I'm gonna ask Councilor Markov Swain, who is our representative, if he would support moving that first motion. Councilor Markov Swain. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I, I definitely won't reread that again, but uh, an absolute pleasure to, um, to move that recommendation. Thank you very much. All right, so discussion on the motion. Councillor Danlock. Thank you, Your Worship. 
and Alan Tiga. So thank you for all your work. As Councilor Montgolf Swain mentioned, there's a lot of people to thank in this whole situation and how we got to this point now, especially the Council Montgolf Swain being the lead of our council on this commission. A lot of moving parts, lots to understand. And we have a very good briefing as all the way along how we got to today. And I'm very excited about it. And I want to thank the previous council for going on a bit of a limb and putting transit into Beaumont. Uh, it was a first step for us. So having not had a transit system already, we'd be a little further behind the eight ball in turning how this commission would work. So credit is credit we're due. And we have a transit system now that's going to get expanded dramatically with this commission. And it's going to save a lot of people money too, because not only does it save us money as a council, but people can have their university students living in Beaumont take a 10 o'clock train or a bus to Edmonton, LRT downtown, go to school, do a one o'clock class and come home doing my supper time. They can't do that now. The commission will do that for our, our community, which means economic development will, 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 will go crazy for Beaumont. So I fully endorse this, uh, this motion and our work at council has done to get us here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any further questions or statements from other members of council on this particular item this evening? All right, I've already thrown in my two cents and I'm very supportive of this initiative. So at this point, without further ado, we'll call the question. All in favor, oh, hang on, got to catch up to the agenda. All in favor. In favor. Answer my, and that carries unanimously. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Well done. Uh, we do have one more motion that we need to make tonight that council directs administration to continue the pre-implementation work to stand up the commission provided that the strategic alignment and feasibility of the commission for the city of beaumont and their region is maintained councillor stout thank you worship so moved thank you very much discussion on the motion councillor mongoswain yeah i just want to make a quick comment about this one and, and i think uh, alan touched on it before about um the governance structure the board structure um you know, we, we did have a really robust discussion around this, whether it was going to be 13 municipalities or whether it was going to be uh, potential for a skills based board. Uh, was there a mix? Uh, I personally, um, you know, wasn't too comfortable with having 13 municipalities around that without the skill set. I think also it is a large board, um, but I think it, it goes to the testament of the of the commission around or the, the group around the table there. Um, where we landed on um, that that 24 month check in to see is this is this working is having 12 municipalities hopefully uh, around the table without much skills obviously we've got a we've got administrative function to help support us through this um, but I, I'd be uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how that first 24 months goes um, but really appreciate the, the fact that we we added in that that, that required 24 month check on that board and governance so. Um, not necessarily specific to this motion, but I, I didn't get that that word in there previously. So um, I just wanted to just to acknowledge acknowledge that. So um, yeah, obviously uh, in support of this uh, this motion. Okay, wasn't quite sure where you're going there, but okay. Um, seeing no further discussion, call the call, call the question. All in favor? Councillor Van Newker. In favor. Uh, yeah. Carries unanimously as well. Thank you very much once again. Great work, awesome job. And at that point, we're gonna take a quick five minute break before we move on to 8B.
to order. Which brings us to item 8B, uh, 2020 budget approval. This whole thing, <laughs> this whole little thing that keeps us moving. Uh, so, who from administration would like to kick this off? Mr. Dollar. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of council. I don't have a formal presentation, just more opening remarks, and then uh, we can turn it over to council. Uh, before council this evening is the 2020 operating and capital budgets. Administration believes these budgets deliver on council's strategic plan, specifically the goals of good governance, building and maintaining infrastructure, building economic pathways, recreation, celebrating our diversity and efficiency. These budgets have been developed and reflect all adjustments from several hours of deliberations. This all results in a tax rate increase of 1.6%, the lowest increase in over 10 years. For the average homeowner in Beaumont, this amounts to a $45 per year increase to their property tax bill. The 2020 budget also includes an increase in utility rates of 2%, or approximately an additional $25 per year for the average household. The 2020 budget adds significant recreation opportunities for residents and at the same time protects current programs, services, and infrastructure, all at a time of fiscal restraint. In addition to funding staff and equipment for the opening of the expanded Beaumont Sport and Recreation Center, the 2020 budgets provide support for a feasibility study for the arts facility, new outdoor rinks in Donzeroo, and at Ken Nickel Recreation Center, additional baseball diamond and park equipment in Colonial, and conceptual design and geotechnical study for an outdoor multi-use field. If council approves the budget tonight, administration will return at the April 14th city council meeting with any required final amendments prior to bringing forward the property tax bylaw for approval at the April 28th city council meeting. Property tax notices will then be mailed out to residents with payment of taxes due by June 30th. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions council may have. Thank you very much. I do appreciate this. Um, this, has been, this has been a lot of work by both administration and council, so thank council and thank administration for all the time and effort that's been put in this. We've had a fairly robust discussion back at our budget workshop. We had a really good discussion around some sober second thought items that accumulated the whole last week. So at this point, I am prepared to move the first of three recommendations that Council approve the 2020 operating budget as outlined in Attachment 1 with total tax-supported operations with revenue of $46,029,800 and expenditures of $46,029,800. Tax-supported operations revenue of $46,029,800 includes A, revenue-based on the General municipal property tax levy is estimated to be $20,604,000, a 1.6% tax increase. And library taxes are estimated to be at $795,700. And non-tax revenue of $24,630,100. Discussion on the motion. Or questions for admin. Councillor Moncoswain. Yeah, more of a, a statement, I, I guess, than anything. I just uh, acknowledge administration for all the work to, to bring this together. Um, really appreciate the, the tight time frames uh, we had with, some, with new resources jumping on board. Um, so thanks for all the hard work to pull this together. Um, and really just a, a comment around a lot of the engagement that we had at our open houses um, that I know all of us have had with, with residents through our different uh, mediums and forums. Um, you know, there, there wasn't that but that many concerns um, I, uh, and you know typically these sort of things you hear about if you get it wrong right and and uh, I really want to um, you know appreciate um, uh, council support on a lot of these a lot of these items particularly in that recreation space which we uh, which we desperately need in the community so um, yeah just wanted to to note that that uh, you know we, we would certainly hear about it and I uh, I haven't heard any, any too many negative things about this so really excited to, to move this forward um, and certainly will be in support of, of this uh, recommendation. Thank you. Councilor Downlock. Thank you, Worship. Just echo Councilor McCoff-Swain's comments. Administration's done a fantastic job 
uh, making this budget understandable by the average person. Many people I spoke to felt it was laid out nicely on the website, easy to follow, understand the concept of operating versus capital budget. Uh, I want to thank Council as well for coming to open houses and, and answering citizens' concerns. Uh, everybody I talked to is happy the fact that we're keeping the tax increases lower each year in our mandate and increasing services and actually building stuff, as the saying went. So people said, you're building stuff, and we appreciate that. So I think it's been a very good budget overall for all kinds of perspectives. Thank you very much. I'll be supporting it, of course. Councilor Barnhart. Thank you, Worship, and I don't have any questions. As you said, we've, we've gone through so many uh, iterations and we've asked lots and lots of questions. So I, too, want to say that I, I really think that this is a, a very fine budget. Uh, as budgets go. Lots of good news stories, uh, neighborhood revitalization, the infrastructure is being dealt with, and there's new facilities and there's new services. So I think all in all, the administration did a fantastic job of looking at efficiencies uh, where possible, restructuring and, and uh, finding ways to come in as close as possible to what we have with a small tax increase. Um, of course, the, the future is going to depend on how much growth we continue to have. And I know that our economic development priorities are helping us to address that, uh, to make sure we don't take our eye off that. Uh, so overall, I'm, I'm just feeling that we um, have done a great job. And, and thanks to your help, the administration, for doing that. And uh, I know the years ahead are going to be a little bit leaner and tighter. And, and we have to just continue to maintain this to be the best place uh, that people want to come and live and work and play. So thank you very much. See you in front Call the question. All in favor? In favor. Councilor Mo Yeah. Councilor Allen? It didn't. No. And then uh, motion number one carries unanimously. Is there a member of council willing to move recommendation number two that the 2020 capital budget be approved in the amount of $11,496,200 as outlined in attachments one and three? Councilor Downlook. Thank you, Worship. I move that the 2020 capital budget be approved the amount of $96,200 as outlined in attachments one and three. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, call a question. All in favor? In favor. Carries unanimously, which leads us to our final recommendation motion this evening that the 2020 utility operating budget be approved as outlined in attachment one with revenues of $10,223,000 and expenditures of same. Is there a member of council prepared to move? Councilor Stout. Thank you, Worship. Um, yes, I move that the 2020 utility operating budget be approved as outlined in attachment one with revenues of $10,223,000 and expenditures of $10,223,000. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Councilor Randy. In favor. And that carries unanimously. Which brings us to. Yeah, very well done. Which brings us to item 9A, bylaw 97-20, 2020 fees and charges for first, second, and third reading. Mr. Robert. Again, just some brief opening comments. Uh, in conjunction with the 2020 budget, administration is bringing forward the 2020 fees and charges bylaw this evening for council approval. Uh, prior to bringing the bylaw forward to council, administration performs an annual review of the fees and charges, comparing the rates for reasonableness to other municipalities in the region and reviewing them for operational considerations. Based on the direction from the February 18th Committee of the Whole meeting, the bylaw before council excludes the majority of Schedule 9, the fees and charges related to the Beaumont Sport and Recreation Center, Administration intends to bring forward the fees and charges related to the BSRC prior to the facility opening later this year. All the remaining changes to the fees and charges have been incorporated into the 2020 budget just approved. And if the bylaw is approved this evening, uh, the fees and charges will become effective March 1st. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, appreciate uh, all the hard work that's gone into these and the discussion that was had at our last community of the whole meeting where we went through this in detail. Uh, is there a member of council willing to move first reading of the fees and charges bylaw? Councillor Downlock. Your Worship, thank you. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, call the question. <coughs> All in favor of first reading? In favor. In favor. Is there a member of council willing to move second reading? Councillor Stout. So moved to Worship. 
Thank you very much. Call the question. All in favor? In favor. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to move that council move uh, to third reading on the fees and charges bylaw. This requires unanimous consent to move forward. Um, this one proceeds without debate. So all in favor? In favor. And that carries unanimously. Is there a member of council willing to move third reading? Councilor Barnhart. So moved, Your Worship. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none. All in favor of third reading? In favor. Thank you. And that carries unanimously. And at this time, I'd like to thank Councilor Van Newkirk, who's about to pop off. I uh, appreciate you sticking with us through the whole meeting up to this point. Thank you. All right, so we're getting down to the, to the last little bits of this meeting. Uh, at this point, uh, we have, we have uh, Councilor Inquires and Reports. I know Councilor Barnard, you had a question for Councilor Stout. This is your opportunity. Uh, asking him in private when I didn't realize you were putting him on the agenda but I, I, I'm fine with that the question is to, oh. <laughs> when, when it wasn't exempted I just thought you said oh go deal with no, it some no, other way so I didn't understand that so no this part is for like the report is receiving for information but if okay. this this part of the meeting if members of council have questions for other members of council this is the time mm -hmm. um, to, to do that or make statements if you wish so okay so you may proceed so thank you and uh, thank you councillor stout for providing the information it was on the uh, maduka district regional waste management authority um comment is made that only three of 27 truckloads of organics met the contamination standards for composting and i've often heard that um people are feeling it's kind of useless to be putting the compost effort to to do the composting uh, when in fact it goes into the landfill anyway. So I'm just wondering if Councillor Stout either today or someday could give us some idea of what, what we could do to encourage our, our residents. Maybe it's an education process. Maybe it's uh, something that uh, we as council um, can learn more about and spread the word. But it's uh, definitely a shame that we're putting that effort and we're not getting the results that we want to get from that. So that was my question. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yes. Um, the, the problem outlined there is basically that the composting materials are sent to Strickland farms who require something like a less than 5% level of contamination. And as they've got oversupply, are quite happy to refuse materials if they don't meet those standards of contamination. Um, and yeah, apparently we've got a quite a low compliance. Um, level. Um, Beaumont is worse than Devon, better than the Duke, as for, apparently. Um, although the, no, none of the municipalities are doing terribly well in this regard. Um, yes, it's primarily an education effort. Uh, the contamination is mostly plastic. In fact, a lot of it is composting materials placed in black plastic bags and then put in the in the um, no, oh, that's what they're telling me they're finding. <laughs> You're shaking your head, but this is the report I have. Um, apparently, yes, so it's an education matter. Uh, there's a fair number of plastic material as well is also found in those. So, yeah, um, the authority is hoping to conduct an education campaign. I don't think it would be a bad idea for the for Beaumont to take to undertake one. It might be a good idea if we supplied literature telling you what you can and can't put in the composting. Maybe stickers on the bins. Um, ultimately, the prop that we can have video camera footage in the cab itself so that we can identify which of the bins were. But that's an extra expense, of course, and considerable extra surveillance so that you can identify which household is not doing it properly and then either refuse to take their composting or serve them with some kind of extra fee for the contamination. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an intractable problem shared by all municipalities and I can also speak from my experience in the UK with putting my parents' garbage out that it's a problem there too. Um, so um, there's no easy way around it. And yeah, most of the material that shouldn't be in there is basically plastic. That's another form of plastic contamination. Fair enough. 
Are there any other questions of either admin or other council members? By council members? All right, seeing none, CAO's update. Well, anticipating that there was going to be a lot of information shared tonight, I haven't pulled a lot, a lot together, but I just wanted to say a few things. Uh, first of all, it's Mardi Gras today. I'm surprised nobody brought beads. Like, and Sam, I'm <laughs> glad you kept your shirt on. So that's an old thing. Very quickly uh, on the budget, uh, administration, you know, appreciates the kind words from, from council uh, and, and acknowledges that this was a very good process and it is a very good budget. And, and I think it shows the alignment between council and administration on how we think um, as far as being fiscally responsible. We, we look forward to the year 2020 of looking at uh, more uh, operating efficiencies to, to even better prepare us for, for 2021, where we'll be bringing the full year of the BSRC up and running. But as we talked about at the workshop, we were very comfortable and confident that we're going to do that without affecting the tax rate. And that, that's that's a pretty good piece of work. That's a $1.2 million touch annually uh, that you're able to find. So uh, that's good work by all. News releases will go out tomorrow. Uh, three very big ones, actually. One, obviously, is the city budget, um, which we just talked about. The other is the Regional Transit Services Commission decision. We will send that out in the morning as well. And the, uh, the third one is uh, the announcement on the inter intermunicipal planning framework. If you recall, that document's been in the works for about two years. And it's uh, a, a framework that really sets the course for the next 50 years of the unified sub-regional uh, vision. And that's uh, between Beaumont, uh, City of Edmonton, and Laduke County. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive, and, and we're excited about that. And we'll see that hit the community. The mayor, you talked about wearing pink, uh, which council did tonight. Tomorrow is actually the anti-bullying day. Um, just did a little bit of reading of it and just to remind everybody that, that the pink shirt uh, day began in, in, in 2007 when a student in Nova Scotia was bullied for wearing a pink shirt to school. Uh, it's since then been recognized annually worldwide as a day to stand against bullying. And that, that's something that our society is, is really wrestling with and uh, something that, that needs to go away. With that, I don't have anything else. Thank you very much. Appreciate it this evening. We have no items of correspondence. Are there any councillors wishing, wishing to make a notice of motion this evening? Excuse me. Seeing none, there are no closed session items, and we are adjourned. Thank you very much for your hard work this evening. <laughs>